Our next speaker is David Benjamin. David Benjamin is principal at The Living and he, he also teaches at Columbia University School of Architecture. Uh, thank you, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, what I want to do today uh, in the context of this event and this panel is talk a little bit about our work at the intersection of biology, computation, and design. And I should also mention that our approach recently has involved hybrid approaches to uh, design and materials. So in other words, we're using biomaterials, but we're using them in the context of a wider design ecosystems. And I should also note that uh, part of our approach involves testing out new ideas and technologies and, uh, for example, new uh, biomaterials at the scale of architecture out in the world. Um, and one thing that's uh, been important for me to note in our work is that uh, although biologists uh, have inspired and biology has inspired architects and designers for many years, uh, biology of today is very different than 100 years ago. Um, and I think we've already seen a lot of great examples of this, um, but some of this work to me shows that it's now possible to do a lot of things that it wasn't possible to do 100 years ago. We can grow uh, cells in isolation on small acrylic chips and subject them to a variety of environmental signals and monitor their response. We can, of course, observe biological systems at high resolution in video and uh, still images. We can observe and study systems like this, the growth of slime mold, and apply it to solve uh, problems at an entirely different scale, such as the design of railway networks, highway networks. Um, we can study things like uh, embryo growth of a tadpole, the growth uh, from one cell to 40 million cells in about 48 hours. But more than that, um, this is work of a collaborator of ours, you can monitor uh, the neurons firing in real time of a tadpole. You can see its heart beating there. This is through the use of quantum dots. Um, and you can also observe under a microscope um, uh, stem cells communicating with one another, sending small molecular signals to one another and determining whether to grow into heart tissue, bone, muscle, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, this is work of another collaborator of ours, Lars Dietrich at Columbia. We can take something like the growth of a bacterial colony, um, speaking of bacteria, um, this complex topological three-dimensional form um, and start to understand it or process it through techniques of computation. So here, we're taking some of Lars Dietrich's samples of bacteria growing in about the size of a quarter and applying techniques of computer vision and machine learning to try to develop an algorithm uh, in the computer design environment that could explain this very complex uh, biological growth process. Um, and so it's in this context, this context of biology becoming part of the palette of design for someone like me, someone like an architect or designer, um, that we've been experimenting with different ways to take advantage of natural living systems um, and use them uh, for the design of uh, projects out there in the world that we're testing at uh, the scale of architecture. So I'm going to describe three projects quickly. The first involves biosensing. And to me, this means using living organisms or using biomaterials to sense something about their environment and trigger a corresponding uh, response. Um, more specifically, out in the world, this project involves a real-time public interface to water quality. So this is a network of uh, floating lights uh, out in the East River in New York City. Um, it's uh, made up of this system of tubes. These tubes are six feet tall. They have sensors below water and lights above water. And they tell us things about our environment uh, that are normally invisible. They make visible the invisible conditions of our environment in a very public way. Um, we've been using the uh, materials um, of the so-called Internet of Things, um, things like microcontrollers and digital sensors. But recently, we've also been using uh, biological sensors. So this is a tank of mussels, living mussels, the shellfish. Um, and you see it kind of pulsing in this fast motion video. Um, that's because the mussels are opening and closing their shells small amount. Well, it turns out um, that uh, the rate and the amount that mussels open and close their shells 
is a very sensitive and sophisticated detector of water quality. In fact, a living mussel is better at detecting water quality than uh, some of our most expensive digital sensors, like a dissolved oxygen sensor at $10,000. And then, with that in mind, um, it turns out that you can take a $2 Hall effect sensor, glue it to one side of a mussel's shell, uh, glue an inexpensive magnet to the other side, and then use the living muscle, this biological material, um, as part of an ecosystem to be sensing things about the environment. Um, we can harness that into the digital environment in a computer that we can take advantage of. And maybe most relevant to um, some possibilities for the future of design in this context is that we could combine um, something like artificial intelligence with natural intelligence. In other words, taking the best the computer has to offer, or you know, the holy grail of computers, artificial intelligence, combine that with something that living organisms already do, and they've evolved over millions of years to do, which is sense things about their environment and, and take actions. Um, uh, and we think that if we could harness both of these properties in a design ecosystem, that could be quite exciting. Um, so we're currently um, building uh, a next generation of what you see here, which is this floating network of lights in the city in the context of other uh, lights in the city um, and making this uh, important feature of our environment um, visible to the public. Um, this will be a 200-foot-long floating pier um, off of Manhattan that's uh, scheduled to go into construction uh, later this year. Uh, number two, biofabrication. So we're also very interested in something we've heard about already in this session and also before, um, about taking living organisms and using them to actually manufacture um, part of the built environment. Um, this project uh, was um, basically a, an experiment in combining living organisms as a building material with synthetic materials, and also an experiment in designing a system and letting it play out for 30 days uh, in this art exhibit um, without intervening. We started with a material effect. This is um, the effect of a viscous liquid, um, in other words, honey. Uh, when you take it on a spoon and you drop it back into the jar, it has this natural coiling effect because of the viscosity of the liquid. Um, and it turns out that uh, you, if you drop a viscous liquid such as honey or a synthetic material like uh, melted recycled plastic, if you drop that onto a conveyor belt that's rotating, um, you can get very complex patterns with just one variable, the speed of the conveyor belt. So if it's going pretty fast, you get a straight line. If it's going slower, you get a kind of wavy line. And if it's going even slower, you can get very complex patterns such as figure eights and other um, complex sewing machine-like patterns. Um, so our uh, idea for the project was to combine the aggregation of a synthetic material, this melted plastic, with a biological material. This is a moss suspended in a liquid um, which sprays out of a nozzle. Um, and have these two materials uh, kind of cooperate and compete in an ecosystem. Um, and these would both be guided by what we call a material of ideas because uh, we can guide the rate of aggregating the plastic and the rate of aggregating the moss based on real-time web searches. So we have three simple ingredients, uh, the natural material moss, uh, the synthetic material, the melted plastic, and this material of ideas all interacting um, in this kind of machine, in this ecosystem. And the important thing for us here is that we designed the rules and relationships, but then we let it play out over time for, for 30 days without intervening. Um, and you see here you know, one uh, kind of clip of that. This is the way that the uh, plastic material is kind of aggregating uh, in a repeating loop and creating these complex three-dimensional patterns. Um, and over time, as this conveyor belt that I described actually becomes a rotating disk, you can see a layering up of material, both the natural material and the synthetic material. And then this shows uh, uh, about 10 days of the 30-day exhibit where, as we created an ecosystem, like other ecosystems, it had a kind of equilibrium, um, a kind of pattern of growth, this cylindrical growth. And then uh, for a variety of reasons, including material reasons, there was a kind of 
tipping point, um, a moment of uh, kind of chaos. Um, but then, interestingly, um, the development of a new kind of more complex equilibrium, which resulted in this kind of banded braiding effect of aggregation. Um, really, for us, the, the project represents something that's possible in the context of biomaterials, but in the context of just uh, other trends of design as well, which is design with uncertainty, design um, not necessarily of fixed final forms, but of rules and relationships. Um, you could look at this um, as a kind of a bottom-up 3D printer, so not a top-down uh, CNC fabrication version of a 3D printer where you already know exactly what you want and you try to get it through precision uh, and zero-tolerance manufacturing, but a 3D printer that allows some kind of feedback and interactivity, including uh, the growth of biological materials. Um, and finally, the last uh, project that I'll describe is another example of biofabrication. This is a construction that we did for the Museum of Modern Art and MoMA PS1 uh, last summer. And this project began with an idea about ecosystems, natural biological ecosystems, the healthy loop of the carbon cycle. And of course, we know that the way we make most of our stuff, including most buildings, uh, is not super healthy, not compatible with the carbon cycle. In other words, we take high value raw materials, we spend a lot of energy converting those raw materials into building blocks, we assemble those building blocks into a building, and when we're done using that building, we take all that physical stuff and put it in a landfill. Um, and our idea was maybe we could temporarily borrow uh, from the carbon cycle and then return back to it. In other words, take low value raw materials, spend almost no energy converting the raw materials to building blocks, make something useful, and at the end of the useful life, return all that physical stuff uh, to the soil, to the carbon cycle, in 60 days, rather than uh, being in a landfill for hundreds or thousands of years. How do we do this? Well, of course, through a biomaterial, through a living organism. This is mycelium uh, under a microscope. It shows the branching root-like uh, structure um, that um, part of a mushroom grows. Um, and it turns out that if you take mycelium and combine it with agricultural waste, um, not the high value part of agriculture, not the corn kernels, but agricultural waste, the chopped up corn stalks that no one wants, put that mixture together in a mold of almost any shape, uh, pack it in, and then uh, over about five days that you see here sped up, um, this grows into a solid object that's potentially useful. Um, this is something that we were uh, collaborating with a great startup company in upstate New York called Ecovative uh, to do. Um, they've been using this process and this material, this biomaterial for packaging, and we developed a collaboration to break new ground in exploring the use of this material for um, architecture, to make a new kind of brick um, that was a use of this material outdoors for a structural uh, rating. Um, here's the brick we came up with. Since no one had created a large-scale outdoor application of this biomaterial before, we had to do a lot of testing. I won't get into the details here, but here we're uh, crushing one of our poor bricks under 100,000 pounds of force. We also crushed assemblies of bricks because it was important for us to know how the bricks would behave individually, but also when they're assembled together. Um, and this was not just for research sake. It was because uh, if you want to design a large-scale structure out of a new material, like a biomaterial, um, one of the first things that you might do is try to simulate it in software, but uh, then you run into the problem that uh, no uh, structural engineering software on Earth has a drop-down menu item for mushroom brick, so you need to uh, figure out a way to develop a, a custom material profile for the material to be able to calculate whether this structure will stand up. Our first iteration, we were having some problems. The red areas are problems, basically. And then we iterated on the material design, um, the brick shape design, and the macro structure design um, to come up with a design that was acceptable. One other thing of note is that um, biomaterials can be interesting in, in new ways, unlike some traditional materials. This shows that uh, the material, these mushroom bricks, had a different consistency on the inside than the outside. Um, and this meant that. Uh, we could not solve some uh, uh, problems that we would uh, 
traditionally solve in certain ways in architecture in the same ways with this biological material. In other words, we can take a brick of a known shape, we honed in on the brick we wanted, and we can uh, pretty easily create um, straight walls, single curved walls, but as soon as you have a double curved wall, you have a couple of problems to solve. You need to um, make up a perimeter length of each course, which is different, so you have a spacing problem, a fitting problem, um, and you need to stack every brick on top of two other bricks so it interacts as a system. Um, in other words, you can't stack bricks directly on top of each other because they wouldn't act um, in a stable way. Um, and here we used uh, computation to solve the problem. How would we um, create the layout of a few uh, brick types that we know, um, aggregate them together so that they create our complex overall 3D geometry um, and never have to cut a brick on site because uh, the unusual property of the material meant you can't cut it on site. Uh, we came up with this approach, was it, which involved an iterative search for every single brick. Was it resting properly on the two other bricks? And then a kind of spacing mechanism. And this allowed us to create the plan for the overall structure. We had about um, three weeks to construct it on site. We had to solve a lot of problems on site. And here, our ecosystem of materials, both you know, natural materials and some uh, synthetic materials, um, intersected with a kind of ecosystem of expertise or knowledge or labor. In other words, we were working with Columbia University graduate students in architecture. They know a lot about geometry, form, computation, and uh, we were working with New York City brick masons who know a lot about stacking units uh, and making up tolerances. Neither one al alone knew enough uh, to solve all the problems on site, so there was this uh, interesting back and forth um, and on-site troubleshooting. Um, in the end, we created a structure that was at once kind of familiar and completely new. Here you see it in the context of the glass and steel buildings of Manhattan, uh, the skyline of Manhattan behind, and also the traditional brick buildings uh, of MoMA PS1 and Queens. Um, it's kind of designed to frame the natural environment, to have interesting um, aesthetic and material and atmospheric effects in addition to just being a functional material. Um, it has interesting effects of pattern and lighting. Um, the top is open to kind of frame the natural environment and the ever-shifting sky. Um, but of course, the ultimate test of, of this project every year, um, as it's constructed at MoMA PS1, the ultimate test is its ability to host a party. Um, and this was um, both um, terrifying for us to see, this is a, a, a video of the first party, um, and you can see you know, our, our science experiment out in the world, so it's terrifying for us, but also um, incredibly exciting because if nothing else, as architects and designers, we want to um, test not just uh, on a lab bench and not just the way architects might make a typical mock-up, which is on a vacant lot somewhere, um, to test a facade prototype, but we wanted to test it in the context of uh, the public, of people, of culture, um, of interactions on things like social media. Um, finally, we had to create a different kind of documentation of this project with the natural uh, material, um, different kinds of drawings. Um, and, and probably most importantly for the idea of the project, um, this uh, entire structure uh, was composted at the end of its life. So we took apart the bricks, um, put it uh, in a composting facility, and it's now been returned to soil and is growing. Uh, new plants. So in other words, something that's designed to disappear as much as it's designed to appear. Um, my final observation is that, um, you know, in the context of biological materials, one thing that might be interesting to note is that it, uh, with biological materials, we may be able, as designers, to um, specify a new type of quality of materials. We normally think of specifying the color, the texture, the strength but maybe we could also specify um, the lifespan. In other words, we can make a version of a mycelium material that lasts for two weeks or two months or two years or 20 years or even uh, 200 years, and that uh, represents an exciting possibility. Thank you.
Thank you. Please welcome now Susan Lee, founder of BioCouture and founder of the Biofabricate Conference. Thank you, Athena. And thank you, Skylar, for the invitation. It's really great to be here, and I'm so looking forward to the next couple of days. Um, I feel like a slight fish out of water coming from a fashion textile background. Um, but to give you a little bit of background as to how I got here, I'm a child of the 70s and a real sci-fi fan. The, the fascination with science and technology in the future was really something that took me into my career as a fashion designer. And I never really lost that. And of course, fashion by its very nature is something that's concerned with the future. But the industry, unfortunately, has such a short, narrow focus, which is pretty much what we're going to be doing next season, that it's very difficult to focus on any kind of long-term R&D that you might want to do on materials, something that's more in-depth. And unfortunately, fast fashion means that cycle is becoming ever, ever sped up. And that's really why, for me, there are designers going back to the 1960s who were still huge inspiration. If you look at people like Pierre Cardin, Paco Rabanne, André Courage, they were all really um, inspired to experiment and, in fact, worked with chemists to look at new polymers and new ways of manufacturing because they were interested in discovering how else to create surface texture, silhouette or construction that would enable new ways to consume product. If we think about someone like Paco Rabanne, you could say that he anticipated 3D printing. What he was doing by hand is what we now are using CAD tools for. And even Cardan was really prescient around the idea of biodesign and using biology uh, for the future manufacture of, of clothing. So this kind of focus on the future for me ended up in a book which was about uh, how can science and technology re help us to reimagine what fashion might look like, not next season, but 5, 10, even 50 years hence. And you don't discover those solutions by speaking to yet more fashion designers. So I had many conversations with engineers and scientists from many different backgrounds, and one of the most interesting was with a biologist. And he proposed to me, if you're trying to rethink how you create something like a piece of clothing, rather than think about a fiber coming from a plant in a field like cotton, look to a microbe, a bacterium, which could also synthesize a nanofibril of cellulose and not only produce this pure fiber for you, but actually organize that into a structure that ultimately could give you a vision of a three-dimensional garment in a vat of liquid. For me, that was completely mind-blowing. And from that moment onwards, you know, the last sort of 15 years or so, the focus has been around uh, biodesign, and um, well, bringing design and biology together. These were my first uh, encounters with Acetobacter, the, uh, the bacterium that produces the cellulose. And this went towards um, a recipe and thinking about textile production or, or garment production as something more akin to, to food and food production. So we were using green tea and sugar with a symbiotic mix of yeast and bacteria over a period of time to produce a wardrobe. And the, um, although we looked at things like pure bacterial cellulose, actually the recipe that we used was um, something that you're more familiar with if, you, if you've drunk kombucha. And this mother culture that is put into this fermented um, sugary green tea over two weeks is producing a pure layer of cellulose at the air interface, which was what we then took to harvest. And the reason for using that particular mix of organisms is that the resulting sheet was incredibly flexible. So it had, unlike the pure cellulose, which was more plastic and film-like, this had you know, something that was akin to a vegetable leather. And it ha its textile possibilities were very um, you know, interesting and intriguing. The, um, the production method was incredibly simple, just using a static culture. So these were bathtubs filled with a sugary green tea solution sat on heat mats with thermostats just regulating 24-7. And 
a mini fabric farm in the summer outside my studio was able to produce you know, several meters of the material at a, at a time. And then depending on what we wanted to do with them, they were either left to dry or used in a wet state uh, to form over a mold. During the process of, of this research, you know, this was taking place in an in a, albeit experimental fashion textile school at Central St. Martins in London. Whenever I discussed the words uh, bacteria and fashion in the same sentence, people were revulsed by it. It just, no matter how we talked about it, the fact that the garment is not bacteria, the garment is the production of bacteria, and that the garment itself is the same as your you know, as a traditional piece of clothing that you might be currently wearing, we couldn't get past this idea that everybody kept saying to me, no one is going to accept, you know, clothing that's made in this way. So then the challenge became not, um, you know, what can we do with new aesthetics for this, but actually how can we normalise this very unconventional process so that in the minds of the people, the consumers, ultimately, it's something that they would accept. So the decision went from doing a very new design to something that was incredibly conventional and familiar. And we decided that something which was kind of globally recognizable, genderless, with something like a, a kind of denim-style jacket. So this was actually an exact copy of a Levi's jacket. And the whole thing was cut and sewn completely conventionally. Um, the garment on the left before it was dyed and then um, dipped in indigo. And this is the, the finished jacket. So although this was a research project, it had no original commercial intent. The, the, the research question was nothing other than, is it possible to grow a garment using a biological system in a vat of liquid? Um, because it was so wearable, we had many inquiries, both from potential consumers wanting to buy it and from other designers wanting to purchase the material. And suddenly it became a real kind of exploration of sustainability in fashion and the fact that there was a real um, search on, on, the, on behalf of big brands and designers who were looking for new materials that had a much better environmental footprint and who wanted to kind of investigate whether this might be a potential replacement for some of the fibers that were currently being used. Um, so there was a series of prototype garments produced. We explored how do we actually introduce color without using any chemicals or dyes. So using the acidic nature of the material and oxid iron oxidation to create black instead of dyeing it. Um, using what happens if you, if you, t you know, tip a strawberry down a white t-shirt and it stains. Using fruit and vegetable staining to color it. But kind of like um, David was saying earlier, thinking about the end of life of this, this piece of clothing. So something that you could ultimately throw out into your garden with your vegetable peelings and that it would compost rather than join the billions of tons of clothing that go into landfill every month. <clears throat> so there were two different kind of ways of thinking about it. We grew very simple 2D sheets, which was a very simple um, static culture. The ultimate vision of it really was to say, imagine if we could take a CAD file of your personal bespoke measurements, create a three-dimensional form of that, and then have that growing within the bioreactor and use this bacterial system to be attracted onto that form and to produce the fibrils, organize it into the material, and then basically grow a finished product for you. So that could be a, a jacket or a shoe or a bag. But how would that reimagine the, the textile and fashion production system? And so the bag on the right, um, this wasn't actually grown in a vat, but it was mocking it up. And what we discovered was that this was constructed without any stitching, just by overlaying the wet material. And when the fibers come together as the water evaporates, they, they created much stronger bonds than had they been seamed in a normal way. So usually the seam is the weak point in, in any kind of uh, garment or accessory. But here, the seams actually became the strong point. So the handles on the bag were, were it, the bag would break at the top rather than where the join was first. Uh, 
Many other things were explored along the way. What if we could, if we're growing something in this way, what if we put things into that solution? Uh, other materials create composites. Uh, we tried putting um, dye in the same bath so we reduced the amount of water. The bacteria um, proved to be incredibly resilient. So we could, even when um, you know, chemicals fell into the vat, it would carry on growing. So you could actually reduce the system down to a really efficient, minimal um, production. At the same time as we were exploring the bacterial cellulose, we were also looking around at things like the mycelium production that uh, David was mentioning and started to think about all these different types of living organism producing different types of material and what happens when they come together. Here, the shoe is kind of a, a thinking exercise around that. If we, it's a complex structure shoe, you know, it needs, it's going, it's, it has to withstand lots of force, needs to be lightweight, flexible, uh, have recovery. So the internal structure of the heel here was grown using uh, a, a mycelium waste product. And then thinking ultimately about how could different types of organism grow materials for different qualities over one another. These were actually grown separately, but the, the kind of vision of that was what if you could grow cellulose over something like chitin with mycelium? How do we build multiple structures together? And the, the kind of culmination of all of the project, I, I suppose, is, is represented in these two products here. So, you know, my focus has always been about taking this to industry. How do we actually change what, what's out there in the world? And when you start to look at the techno-economic case for producing something like cellulose in this way, for me, that's where it gets really interesting. Because on the left, we have a pure bacterial cellulose material, which is kind of yay big sells for about 10 bucks and is the result of many years of biotech research, multiple patents, and you know, went into the high value field of biomedical research. And the, on the right, very cheap food product that is um, very familiar if, you're, if you go to Indonesia or the Philippines, which is using the waste stream of the coconut water industry and then the same microbes being put into that to grow for a sweet dessert. And that sells for under a dollar a jar. So very different um, price points for the, essentially the same product. And the challenge being to take this into something like a garment, the, the value of the fiber that you're wearing is so minimal, such a small percentage of the ultimate uh, you know, tag price of the garment that with, with a product like cellulose, you're competing with the commodity of cotton, which is super cheap. So really the scale up of that at an industrial level is where the challenge comes. So then you get into thinking, okay, this cellulose has to do something that the cotton in the field can't do. What are the particular qualities that you could engineer into that cellulose? that would give it additional functionality, whether that's some kind of new performance function or an extra kind of aesthetic, it needs to deliver more value. Um, but above, yeah, so I'll, I'll move on to something else, but just as a footnote to that, um, I left the bacterial cellulose project a, a while ago, but there is a group in um, California who are at the Indie Bio uh, incubator there, and they're called BioLoop. And they've kind of picked up on this bacterial cellulose idea. Um, there's a video that's not playing right now on YouTube, but their, their project's called BioLoop. So they are uh, dissolving the cellulose, creating a dope, and then wet spinning a, a, a fiber. And I'm really excited to kind of see where they can take it, because in this form, you could certainly, in the same way that Fio was talking about adding new function into silk, add new functionality into the cellulose fibers, and then I think you have potentially an interesting product that will, will start to excite people. Um, for myself, I kind of ended up in this strange territory between these two worlds. Um, you know, really where design and biology come together, um, I kind of fundamentally believe now that this is going to be the future of my world, my industry. And if 
you know, if we really want to kind of solve some of the sustainability and smart issues that we're addressing in fashion, this is, this is where we need to look. Um, today, I have a role as a creative director of a biotech company called Modern Meadow in Brooklyn. And our focus is on mammalian cells, growing them not for biomedical uses, but towards a future consumer product. So Modern Meadow are focused on taking mammalian cells and producing leather, but without the death of the animal, so with no animal slaughter. And, you know, this, this for me is a really exciting juncture because for the last 10 years I'd been thinking about as a designer, what does it mean to design a material from the bottom up? How, can we, how does that change the way that we might think about a piece of clothing or, or a sports shoe? And... Finally, this is just beginning to happen. What are the new performance and aesthetic functionality that we can start to design into something? What can we borrow from the world of tissue engineering, whether it's kind of bioprinting or weaving? These skills are coming from that world, but now being applied into a vision of a future consumer product. And I'd just end by saying, I can envision the kind of future creative studios, you know, the white-coated haute couture salon joining the, the white-coated scientist to ultimately create in the not-too-distant future, perhaps, uh, instead of 3D printing a synthetic um, speculative textile surface, to actually be able to grow it for real uh, from biology. So I'll leave it there. I've gone a bit over time, but... We <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And our last speaker for this session is Paul Antonelli, Senior Creator of Architecture and Design at New York's Museum of Modern Art. Thank you very much, Athena, and thank you to all the presenters that came before me for being so amazingly inspiring today, and also they have been in the past. Like Suzanne, I also live in a strange world of intersections, but I've seen that so many of you do today. And uh, the same world, are we, uh, yeah, that's it, voila, <laughs> let me just make it go. The same world that we live in uh, today is a world that somehow mankind has lived in for a very long time. Ladies and gentlemen, the ranchu. The ranchu is a special goldfish, also called the king of goldfish, that's been hybridized by the Japanese since the beginning of the Edo period to be seen from above, to have that amazing shape that makes for pure aesthetic delight. It doesn't keep you company, it doesn't talk, it doesn't do anything, it's just there to be admired, not even as a three-dimensional, but rather as a two-dimensional biological object. Is there any matter more programmable than that? And that's been done because of popular wisdom for centuries. Interestingly, in about a month is going to be the 20th anniversary of my first show at MoMA that was called Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. The idea behind that show is that finally designers themselves could design the materials without having to go to chemical engineers and scientists because thanks to new resins that could be cured at ambient temperature, thanks to composites that could almost be molded as sculptures, they could, they could modulate their materials in their offices, in their studios. It's funny to find myself here 20 years later talking about matter programmable at a much more, much deeper, much smaller, much more molecular level. But let's talk about program to begin with. It's something that's been mentioned before by some of my colleagues. There's two ways to program, and there's two ways to think of robots. You know, we were talking about the Kinko bot or Kinko robot store. On the left-hand side, Bob de Graaf, the old idea of the robot, Rosie from the Jetson, the robot that's taking care of us, that's like reliable, like a passive pet that does everything we want. On the right-hand side, Dan and Raby's idea of neurotic, needy, uh, kind of like idiosyncratic robots that before starting to 
do something for us and we don't know exactly what that will be, need to be cuddled, need to be secured and reassured. Robots, in other words, that need some interaction before they reveal themselves for some function that we don't know yet that might be much more than what we expected. This ambiguity and ambivalence, I think, is at the core of so much of the idea of programming matter in design. Scientists tend to have a little few more certitudes, not that many. Actually, it's a, it's a cliche to think that scientists uh, think in certitudes, but designers certainly have more. And that's why I've been thinking a lot about quantum design lately, about the idea of ambiguity and ambivalence. And I'm talking about it as a non-scientist, therefore mine is kind of a Sunday science. But thankfully, I found another writer, a really good writer, Miranda Tremier, that wrote a piece in 2012 for the New Inquiry, for the New Inquiry, the, the, um, the magazine, talking about a speculative piece about wanting to come face to face with a quantum computer. It was an obsession that she has, that she had, and so much so that she tracked the closest quantum computer as being at Yale and tried to start dating even some people that were working in the lab in order to get to the quantum computer. Well, when she got to the quantum computer, of course, she couldn't see much because quantum computers are so delicate and they can be uh, displaced and they can be stopped by even the breath of a cloud miles and miles away that she couldn't really relate to this cold being, but she could imagine all that could go on inside the computer, the idea of entanglement of ambiguity of the same thing happening at the same time. And so the poetry of a non-scientist got completely released and unleashed by the idea of the quantum computer and the idea of the infinity machine and so on and so forth. And she wrote something beautiful. I mean, you can read it all if you want, but it was her interpretation of the quantum computer. But what really strikes when you look at this particular uh, periods is delicate quirks and unpredictability, the efficacy of ambivalence or ambiguity, and the idea that ambivalence and ambiguity are smart collaborators that not only share their uncertainty, but sharpen it into a precise mode of communication. Just like Suzanne sees the future of fashion, garment making, in the kind of intersection of aesthetics, purpose, doubt, and science, I do the same for all of design, including fashion. And I also do something quite typical for a museum curator. I look at the past to understand more about the future. And once again, we've been programming matter forever, from the destriers, the sturdy war horses in the Middle Ages, to the lab rat, not to mention the dogs that we all adore that are little monsters of nature and of human artifice, we've been doing it for a long time. And um, Revi Talcoin and Turban Balin are some of my favorite interpreters of this conundrum of science and also of production, have come up with this new project that is actually based on the Ranchu uh, goldfish. It was from their video. Not only have they studied the idea of designing and manufacturing a goldfish without reproductive <coughs> organs that can be hatched directly without reproducing by itself, but also they worked with a Chinese scientist and then choreographed all of the different motions of the, um, of the act of producing this kind of sterile fish, and they have condensed them into a machine that you see there that is not the real machine where the fish is made, but is rather a machine that sculpturally represents the methodology and the process. It's very mediated, it's very meta, but you'll see in other work by them that this idea of how matter can be programmed, even live matter, needs and bears and really demands more thoughtful analysis, and artists and designers can help provide that analysis. Um, at the Museum of Modern Art, we've been exploring that for a long time. I mean, you see on the left-hand side, top left, I, want to, I wanted to show off, because it's not only the 20th anniversary of Newton Material, it's also the 20th anniversary of the MoMA website, which I coded by myself. I learned HTML, and I made that horrible website that is still available, and it has the whole checklist. But so Newton Materials happened um, in uh, 1995, but then there's been many other 
episodes, Design and the Elastic Mind is an exhibition that I did in 2008 where actually many of the people in this audience uh, were represented happily. So Biodesign is by William Myers, who was at MoMA was inspired by Design and the Elastic Mind to write this book. And then more recently, you'll see there that David Benjamin is seated there together with Dan Grashkin and together with Daisy Ginsburg and uh, from, uh, and from the Wies Institute, also representative there, talking about synthetic biology and design. So it's really part of what MoMA is doing in programs and hopefully soon also in collection. I've been trying for a while to collect the work of Symbiotica. You might know about them. They're based in Perth. It's a lab that is found, has been founded by designers, but works a lot with scientists and with artists. And you know, they did little wings made of pigs themselves because, haha, when pigs can fly. Uh, and also, they did that beautiful piece over here called Victimless Leather that was displayed at Design and the Elastic Mind in 2008 at MoMA, and which I had to euthanize personally because it was growing too fast. And the funny thing, you know, Suzanne was talking about how Modern Meadows is making this kind of uh, in vitro uh, biological materials without damaging any animals. The quandary that this kind of work puts you in is extremely interesting because when I had to terminate that coat because it was growing too fast, I could not sleep for nights feeling like the governor of Texas. I mean, and the guys from Perth, the guys from Perth were saying, Paula, was never alive to begin with. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's alive. So it really is interesting to see how much that puts everything in question. And you know, we know about synthetic biology. What I find very interesting, I don't have to talk to you here in the, in the land of iGEM about synthetic biology, but I really find it interesting because the iGEM registry talks about thousands of different sets of DNA to be used as prototypes as compatible, composable, interchangeable, and independent so that new biological system may be constructed with little knowledge or concern for the origins, construction, or biological activities of the components. Fascinating. Who cares where they come from? Let's see what we can do with them. Uh, ethical uh, dilemmas, of course, abound. And uh, I would like here to talk for a moment about David Benjamin's uh, colleague, Andrew Hessel, who's a, a wonderful scientist. Um, at, you, you probably know about him at Autodesk. And he's not only one of the first ones to um, produce this 3D printed virus and talk about it and also replicate it in 3D modeling. I'm trying to acquire it uh, into the collection of MoMA in June. Let's see what happens. It might be a little hard to sell to my acquisitions committee, but also to talk about the possible consequences of what he's been doing. And we know that that's been, there's been a presidential commission studying all the ethical um, consequences of synthetic biology. Designers, of course, are going crazy, especially speculative designers. You see here the work of Michael Burton and Susanna Soares that talk about the social implications of synthetic biology. Michael Burton in particular sees a dystopia where the diverse, where the, the in, um, disparity between classes is actually heightened by the advent of synthetic biology and nanotechnology. And these speculative projects abound. And then we have here the speculative essay by Andrew Hessel himself, which talks about hacking the president's DNA. So there's so much that can be discussed and hypothesized about what could go wrong. But let's talk for a moment about what could go right. I want to show you here a view of the galleries of MoMA right now. You see on the left-hand side work by Neri Oxman um, and uh, some collaborators. And you've heard Neri this morning. I don't have to repeat, but she really tries to uh, bring together nature and artifice in a way that is hard to find elsewhere uh, in the world today. And then you see here also the work of Eric and Martin Demain. Eric is in the audience right now. That's been acquired in 2008, their computational origami, that also, albeit in a non-biological material, tries to get at the, same, um, at the same conclusions. And then you'll see it afterwards, very small there, are some works, but the biobricks, uh, not biobricks, you'll see, by uh, the Wies Institute. Not to mention nervous system. I, I know that Jessica is here. She's going to talk tomorrow. Therefore, deprinting, printing which is also another way to program matter to make it at the same time programmed, but also 
free-flowing to adapt itself to different bodies and to different desires and different personalities. Also, this is on display in the galleries of MoMA together with not anything else but the living's mycelium bricks that David just uh, explained to you in detail, and also the organs on chips by the Wies Institute. As you can see, the uh, border between living, biological, designing nature, and instead old school design is very much alive in the mind of this curator and the museum that she represents. I also tried to convince MoMA to install uh, Neri and the Mediated Matter Group's silk pavilion, that it was just breathtaking for those of you who saw it uh, last year in the atrium of the MIT Media Lab, not to mention the beauty of the video that shows the little silkworms, heroes of today's synthetic biology design, uh, being the, the construction workers and the 3D printers of the whole pavilion. We also have Tomas Libertini uh, using a different kind of scaffold and not much of an algorithm, having 40,000 bees make a vase in a week. And Marcus Kayser, that was actually in residence at Harvard, using the sand of the Sahara and the beams of the sun shining above to 3D print vessels that at the same time look like they've been 3D printed millennia ago, but carry the scars of uh, laser sintering in a way that could never happen millennia ago. So you see, it's really important to be able to consider also um, from a non-scientific but rather artistic and art historical uh, manner these new ways of designing. Broken Nature is a project that I'm working on right now. It's called Broken Nature because the idea behind it is that we've pushed it a little too far and we need to give back to nature what we've taken. There's an idea that, uh, uh, that I have that we almost have to pay reparations. And I use this very, very heavy word, this very heavy noun on purpose, even though I often get into trouble with my African-American husband. But I believe that if we don't push also from a propaganda standpoint as curators, this idea, not only to you who are already sensitive to this, but also to the audience at large, not much will happen. And I'm showing to you here to close Stuart Brands and Ryan Fallon's project that you might have heard about, which is one to try and revive species that have become extinct, in particular the passenger pigeon that used to be the most frequently found bird in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century and by the end of the 20th century has gone completely extinct. Now that's of course the extreme of the parabola of this idea of mending broken nature, but I believe that designers and scientists together merging their savvy and merging also their sensitivity towards human and non-human nature can do the best job for our future. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Um, thanks so much. I invite all the speakers up to the table so we can have a discussion. And what's that? And uh, while that's happening, I'll I'll kick it off. Unbelievable and inspiring both of the sessions so far. One of the things that I found particularly interesting, um, I believe David mentioned it, the bottom up fab with bottom up design, and we've been thinking about this a lot in the research we do and collaborations with various companies because there's this conflict where we're interested in bottom-up fabrication. I think everyone here is talking about that in various ways. Um, but then we're also interested in rethinking the actual design solution that emerges. Can we not just have this preconceived thing that we want to make and then we use bottom-up design or self-assembly to make it? Can we actually go beyond and be open to the design solution emerging? And one of the things that Suzanne brought up was this question of um, acceptance, that she needed to go back to the conventional design in order to gain acceptance of this bottom-up fabrication process. So I'd, I guess I just pose that question, like why do we need the top-down design in order to gain acceptance? When can we have true bottom-up design and bottom-up fab? I think people are scared of bottom-up design. Hmm. 
so <laughs> very simply, right? <laughs> Is that your experience? I mean, for those of us that have contact with them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, there was so much opportunity as a designer for rethinking what something might look like. And you know, we, we were really excited in my studio to sort of think, well, this is gonna change everything in the way of silhouette and do we what does it mean even for care of something like a garment? You know, do we you know, what does that mean for washing? Are you gonna throw this thing in a washing machine? Are you gonna take it rethink? in the shower with you? Yeah. Like, <laughs> are you gonna feed it? You know, are, are you gonna give it some nutrition? Are you gonna encourage it to grow and take on other forms? So there was so much further that we could have gone. But um, if we were going to be serious about having a conversation with industry, it, it felt like we needed to bring it back to something that people felt comfortable with and that that had to be the first step. And as designers, we're always kind of pushing to go further. But, but I think you know, if, if we want to kind of get it out there in the world, then we have to find a comfortable first product. Yeah, I've been, I've been having a very similar experience and thoughts um, one of the, some of the most amazing possibilities of one of the biomaterials I was working with, these mycelium materials, would be, like you're describing, if it continues to be alive out there in the world. So imagine a brick that was still alive. Um, these actual bricks that we were using, so this is not even uh, a brick that's enhanced through bioengineering. One of these bricks um, could exhibit some amazing properties for materials, like self-healing. If you cut it, it would grow back together. Or you could put two bricks together, um, and they would fuse together over time without adding mortar. We did add mortar. But um, we found it important, or I don't know, maybe because we're scared as well, to engage industry and where we are right now. So we made a brick that was manufactured by a living organism and that's compostable and that had, you know, took zero energy to make and grew in the dark, blah, blah, blah. But then it became a static inert object that we could construct somewhat typical architecture out of. And we thought that was an interesting thing to add to the field at this moment. Um, and, and when we took that fork in the road and said, rather than continuing to grow these bricks on site, which we had proposed, and MoMA PS1 said no, um, or keeping them alive, and we're everyone afraid was- afraid of the smell, the smell right? People, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it did smell even though they were dead. But, um, you know, and rather than having them always growing and you know, maybe a new mode of care for a living material, we said, well, it's also interesting and relevant to say, we can make um, materials in a new way that can fit in with industrial processes we know. So we could mass manufacture it. It was relatively um, predictable um, results from one batch of bricks to the next. We could make 10,000 units in six weeks. We could assemble them into a 40-foot structure that didn't fall over. So that part was interesting, too. Now, I don't think it means we have to stop there or not keep challenging the limits. But this role, I think, like you were describing, Suzanne, I think is, is important for some people to be doing, like saying, let's take one or two steps and show that it works and that there's no problems while some other people are taking 10 steps. I also think it's um, you know, about standards and um, qualifications of materials. And certain industries, there's super rigorous standards for good reason, and, and it's hard to overcome those hurdles. I remember talking to some of our collaborators, like, you know, certain industries, you're up in a plane, you may not want your wings to be coming and morphing into crazy shapes you've never seen before. You're like, what the hell is that thing doing? Uh, I hope we're safe. Even though you may be totally safe, like, but there's some understanding of how do they characterize this? How okay am I with that weird shape I've never seen before? So we wanna know it'll go from here to here, and it's gonna do it in this you know, time frame or whatever. But then talking to other colleagues in the medical space, they're like, you know, we'd rather have the design um, solve itself because I may not know what shape the aneurysm is or whatever. And we're totally okay with that on the spot. I'm sculpting it anyway. It doesn't have to have a standard. Everyone's body's different. And so just, you know, questioning that, whether it's industry or whether it's the domain of design or science or engineering, like, 
building that acceptance, but also building the qualification, I think maybe comes from collaborations, right? And maybe it's a collaboration also between, between, between bottom up and top down, because, because a lot of things are predicated on templating, and somehow, whether the templating is driven by industry standards or by, by an, idea of, an idea of the end form that you want uh, ultimately to achieve, um, there is still that happy, that, that happy middle ground, I'm the, I'm the interface guy, uh, but there's still that happy middle ground where, uh, where templating then, uh, templating can be what is borrowed from top-down manufacturing and then feeds on the bottom-up techniques that then can have, can have the adaptable outcomes that I think are the very exciting avenues for these types of materials. And so those could be functional, they could be, they could be the self-healing things that were alluded to, they could be, they could be a, lot of, uh, a lot of other aesthetically pleasing and unexpected results that are still within a template. And nature does it as well, uh, for the most part. So. And a lot, of it is, a lot of that fear is around threat to existing industries, right? You know, it's a, yeah. Yeah. If, you, if we switch to fermentation, what does that mean for agriculture, you know, for yeah. the cotton farmers? If, we, if we're growing things in you know, this kind of facility, what does it mean for all the workers in you know, developing countries around the world? Everybody's out of a job. You know, those, those things come to the fore very quickly. One thing that I think is interesting in this realm for me has been learning from some of the people I've been collaborating with in the field of synthetic biology. I'm, I'm curious to hear other perspectives, but for the sake of argument and kind of oversimplifying, I've seen a slight shift in some of the people I work with from totally buying into the BioBricks um, uh, kind of framework that Paula described the idea that we could eventually take biology and make it as knowable and predictable as electrical engineering and design with these composable standardized parts. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting and great framework and has produced some great advances. But some of the people I'm working with are now saying, well, actually, it's really hard and really complex, which everyone's known all along. But it's even more hard and more complex than we <laughs> thought. And maybe it's OK, and this is where I think it's interesting and gets to what you're describing, Skylar. Maybe it's OK to not design entirely with first principles in biology. You know, so we, we may not have entirely knowable, predictable parts, but we could still design with it. And, and we could have these. That's what designers try to do. I mean, it's, yeah, it's like with, it's limited control. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah, that's a great point. And, and designers are, are good at um, exploring. And exploring means you don't know. Yeah, what many designers today are starting with, I mean, speculative design has become a little too unmoored lately. So sometimes you feel that it's, that you're really in this fiction world, too much into fiction. But what is really important about this is that it starts very often with the question, what if, which is the question that opens up all the possibilities. It's not deterministic. So that's why I'm really pushing towards this idea of quantum design, because I think it embraces that. And, uh, and the collaborations that I've seen between designers and scientists, I mean, there's few that have gone to real fruition. I mean, yours are examples that really became something that goes into the world as almost a product. Um, but even if they don't get there, they always produce some valuable, at least intellectual, conceptual consequence because there's this idea of looking at all the possible um, outcomes at the same time. Paula, I really like the idea of like ambiguity uh, or entanglement and these mm -hmm. ideas, principles as design values, but leaving room for it, you know, not trying to weed it out. Um, maybe we turn it over. Art, you have a question for Mike down here? So um, I would say that probably the, the hallmark of biology is evolution. And evolution is a design criterion. In other words, things are designed in biology in response to the environment and selection. Um, and in fact, I think it's probably the raging argument right now in the synthetic biology community, which is, should we be designing the biocircuits, or should we have evolution design the biocircuits? And I'm wondering uh, what the panel thinks about using evolution. I, I understand that there are some timescale issues, 
uh, depending on the organism, but bacteria can evolve pretty quickly. Yeah, I think Eric could answer that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Um, yeah, definitely time scale is an issue. Um, I think what people oftentimes say is that you can end up in the same time point or the same end point, but there's different approaches to getting there, and evolution is one way to do that in a more um, natural setting, but oftentimes the way that we program bacteria or other organisms can end up in, the, in that same endpoint, but in a, in a faster approach. Um, that being said, there's, there, is so many, there are so many designs that really uh, don't exist yet in nature. Um, for instance, that oscillator design that I talked about is um, a set of genes, three genes from three separate organisms. And so you can imagine thinking of a network like that coming together by evolution um, could take a really long time. In fact, that specific architecture, we know, at least right now, we don't think it exists in nature. Um, it may exist as a community between different bacteria, but within a single bacteria, it doesn't yet exist. So there's a lot of interesting ideas to design that I think um, that we can access that evolution can't necessarily do so. I think uh, also, to, back to David's point of AI with natural intelligence, you know, we've been thinking a lot about this idea of evolutionary fabrication. Like, can you set up some natural evolutionary process, but then bring in some computational process that could speed it up, that could weed out, you know, uh, wrong paths, that could, you know, guide or direct in certain ways and allow bottom-up fab, but um, not with the top-down design. So, I, you know, obviously we're not anywhere close to that, but this, it's an interesting concept, and it linked really well with what you thought, David. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. So one of the things about, um, about human nature when we're talking about what do we accept in our lives is uh, whether or not we th see it as a risk um, to our livelihood or uh, our daily experience, whether it's just an annoyance or, or maybe it's something that's life and death decision. Um, what do you see as um, your biggest what do you see as your biggest uh, considerations when you think about scaling up some of the processes you're designing, when you think about introducing these into the ecology of the rest of the world, which is rapidly changing or evolving at its own individual rate, um, where people look at biologically designed uh, things of the nature that you're designing, and they see it's not, to their mind, a very controlled process. And so they might say, well, there's some risk that this is going to go in a direction that I either can't accept or might endanger or annoy me in some way. Um, how much of that comes into your consideration when you uh, do your work? Well, um, I guess that comes into, into uh, into gen I, I'm not sure how to answer this because uh, because I think that these are these are timeless questions. They, the the context changes. Uh, I think uh, I think that there are people that can imagine very dangerous ways to use a bottle. And I mean, if somebody smashes it on your head, that's not a very benign use of a of a form that we've been used to for many many years. You can find parallels in in a lot of in a lot of things with increasing degrees of complexity. So you know, nuclear energy being being probably one of the most uh, most trite ex examples, if for lack of a better a better term, I suppose um, I suppose that uncontrolled uncontrolled chain reactions are that of uh, of you know of, uh, of of atomic nature versus versus of bacterial nature are 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 things that that concern. But uh, but on the other hand, there are the I, I would say that the opportunity and responsible use of these uh, of these types of approaches is. Uh, um, is a mixture of, of very exhilarating and extremely, um, extremely, uh, and, and can open a world of opportunities that we haven't dealt before. So I don't, I don't think that I have any a, a very, a very deep answer, except that it is, it is part of what what every investigator has done through through time in different in different contexts. So. Um, uh, put our best foot forward, I suppose. If I, if I may add something to that, I work in an educational institution. The havoc we've wrecked, I don't, I never know <laughs> what the 
past tenses, but um, is um, it's quite um, it's quite unstoppable. I believe in the sixth extension personally. I believe that design can design a better ending, like nicer, more graceful ending, perhaps. And as, a, as an educational institution, all I can do is making people aware of how they can behave better, because it's not only the designs that we put out in the world, it's invasive species. I mean, really, it's, uh, there's so much going on. We can be more aware. We can put correctives. We can behave differently. Um, and I believe that the people around this room, around this table, already are moving in that direction, probably. Well, and I think it was a great point you made in your opening slide and the several points in your lecture that we've been designing biological systems for a long time, not with synthetic biology, maybe, but with other means. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I um, want to add is that for the, in response to a lot of the fears about this technology, um, it has to be part of the equation that the do-nothing approach also has risks. So we have to you know, compare the risks of engineering biological systems with the risks of doing nothing or continuing with the way we've fucked things up already. You know? And so what's the, what's the trade-off? That that's the interesting discussion and where the education is important. And probably. Sorry, and probably, and probably one of the one of the greatest links between aesthetics and science is the aesthetics of asking questions and the aesthetics for a scientist to know the the context in which you're operating. And so I think that if you if you are asking the right questions and if you're aware of the context in which in which these technologies will operate, with uh, with a global with a global view of impacts, then that informs your that informs your research, and I think and, and informs the way that you. That you answer, that you answer um, problems and ramifications of what you're doing. All right, we should um, wrap it up. We have a, a break now, so if there's other questions, you can ask speakers in between. Um, housekeeping things: there's a few lost items uh, that are at the front desk, like cell phones and jackets. Hopefully, not grown jackets. But uh, we'll take a, a break, and we'll be back at 3:15. Thanks. <laughs>